Welcome to our webinar about responsible capitalism and how to balancing, balance the ESG integration. This event is organized by the European American Chamber of Commerce, New York. My name is Yvonne Wendinger Rothschild. I'm the executive director of the EACC, and I will be your host for today's event. To make this program interactive, please do uh, ask questions. We will forward them to the panel. Today's discussion will explore how companies are balancing the bottom line with environmentally and socially responsible governance, including integrating um, ESG into business strategy and compliance programs, understanding and applying ESG standards and regulation, and developing ESG metrics and goals for now and for a sustainable future. Our speakers include Istvan Nemet, he's the Policy Officer at the European Commission, um, Director General Grow. In his role, Istvan is working on the corporate sustainability after finishing his econ economic studies and obtaining a diploma in the from the College of Europe, he worked in the field of EU support in Hungary. He joined the EU Commission in 2005 and dealt with SME policy, entrepreneurship, business support networks, and better regulation. We also have Fabio Massimo Natalucci, a Deputy Director of the Monetary and Capital Markets Department of the International Monetary Fund. Fabio is responsible for the IMF's global financial market monitoring and system risk assessment. He's also in charge of the Global Stability Report that provides the IMF's assessment of global financial stability and risks. We have also with us Maureen Klein. She's the VP of Public Affairs and Sustainability at Pirelli Tire North America. In her role, Maureen is responsible for the US, Canada, and Mexico. Maureen chairs the board of the Tire and Rubber Association of Canada and the Sustainability Task Force of the US Tire Manufacturing Association. She's on the Corporate Responsibility Steering Committee for the Automotive Industry Action Group and on the Standards Advisory Group of the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. We also have with us Shelley Willis. She is a partner at Troutman Pepper. Shelley began her career at Troutman and rejoined after serving for more than six years as a former Deputy General Counsel and Assistant Corporate Secretary for SunTrust, now Trust. Our moderator, Brooke Hopkins, is a managing um, director at Alex Partners. And Brooke has more than two decades of experience in corporate governance, environmental health and safety, and security process improvement, controls integration, forensic accounting, compliance re remediation, and compliance program development. And with that, I hand over to Brooke. Thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, wonderful introduction, and we're going to jump right in. One of the things that I want to focus on is business strategy. So we all know we've heard a lot about ESG, environmental, social governance is nothing that should be new really to anyone. But what we're looking at is how is ESG rolling out? How is it going to be effective? And we know that corporations really have the footprint to make change what we're calling responsible capitalism. One of the things that corporations have been looking at is how they define themselves. So we know back in August 2019, the Business Roundtable, 181 different CEOs redefined the purpose of a corporation. What we knew to be benefiting shareholders was redefined to all stakeholders, that really a corporation exists to benefit suppliers, community, employees, and beyond. ESG goes to the heart of this. So let's talk about that, both in the US, Europe, which has been leading the charge with ESG. Let's kick it off and talk about where are companies today? What are they doing? Shelley, can you start? Sure, thank you, Buck. And if we think of ESG as <clears throat> a company's strategies and framework for considering those environmental, social, and governance risks and opportunities for long-term prosperity, as you said, Brooke, it's not, it's not necessarily new. I and mean, it has its roots and back in a focus on sustainability. And you know, for many US companies, you know, that has been a focus for some time. But as you pull that together and look at what was first really a corporate social responsibility focus, um, there are companies in the U.S. that have been been 
sort of gathering that together and, and issuing corporate social responsibility reports, you know, some from the early 2000s. Um, and, and as some companies are pulling that information together, you know, they often find in some aspects, it's a it's a great story they haven't been telling. They've, they've clearly had the governance as a, as a public company in particular because they've had to. And a lot of those social factors um, with the E coming up behind. So I'd say, you know, it's not new in the US. It has clearly reached center stage though because we've gone from a few of those front runners issuing corporate social responsibility reports to a transition to what was then more an ESG report. They're sort of, you know, they're, they're, they're making their debut over the last um, couple of years renamed in that way to the point where um, today, or say looking backward a bit for 2019, nearly two thirds of the Russell 1000 companies, including 90% of the largest 500 companies did publish um, social sustainability reports. Uh, and also 92% of S&P 100 have started to set those emission goals. And um, so it, it, it's not new, but it has really sort of reached center stage and um, given a number of factors that are going on, you know, really um, kicking into gear in 2021. You know, we, we look at a quick progression where originally driven by stakeholders such as BlackRock um, and now, um, you know, a focus that is turning to um, the executive branch with some of our executive orders, the legislative branch with, with some things making their way through Congress. And then certainly a number of regulatory agencies led by the SEC, um, but turning to a number of the financial institution regulatory organizations that are making that analysis today. And I think many companies are, are, are poised to be looking at more to come from the US. Thank you, that's great. So Fabio, let's turn to you. Can you offer us a perspective what is going on in Europe and beyond? Really, what are the changes being made today? What are you seeing companies react to? And maybe even some of the requirements that are rolling out. Well, first of all, thank you for, for the invitation and, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I think one interesting starting point could be trying to look at the differences between advanced economies, if you want, right? That includes US, uh, Europe, uh, part of Asia and emerging markets, because the challenges that emerging markets face are very different than what advanced economies face, both in terms of like physical risk, right, whether this is flooding, fires, and other hazards, also in terms of transition risk, right? how to transition from uh, non-green asset to green asset. There's a lot of more issue related to that transition period, transition finance for emerging markets than there is for, say, Europe or, or for the US. Uh, those firms face not only so different risks, but also the different challenges in terms of reporting. Uh, if you look at data, for example, availability from companies in emerging markets, the quality of data, the comparability, the reliability, also system there to put in place to actually just disclose the data, right, to their lenders or to the investors. So they face a very different set of challenges, starting with quality of data, going to the possible classification of finance, as well as to the disclosure themselves. And that's, you can see that if you step back for a minute and look at the sustainable finance market issuance as a market as a whole, right? So the ESG debt market has been growing uh, very fast in 2021. Uh, just the first half of the year essentially matched issuance for 2020 up to um, 660 billion through the early in the summer. So uh, continuing at this pace is going to pull north of like one and a half trillion. Um, it's very much geographically located primarily in Europe, followed by Asia and the Western Hemisphere. The interesting part there is the role of emerging markets. So emerging markets are much, a much smaller uh, portion essentially of decisions, so they're about 10%. Uh, so it's a smaller share. Uh, it's primarily green bond and, and, and green loans, uh, and it's primarily in Asia Pacific. So I, I think there's a number of, again, differences to keep in mind in terms of like what challenges they face, what kind of instrument they use, uh, and how to help them transition again toward more green and uh, sustainable instruments. Excellent, interesting perspective. And the differences are pretty clear between advanced and emerging markets. Thanks, Fabio. So one of the things, Shelley, you mentioned BlackRock. I think BlackRock has been in the news quite a bit and is well known for Lawrence Fink's uh, statements to companies in which they invest. One of the things they mentioned also in 2019 
through 2021 was that certain companies in which they invest may be dropped from their managed funds if they did not accelerate their focus on ESG quickly enough. So with that, I, I want to turn to Maureen and talk about uh, the corporate perspective and really what pressures companies are feeling, both from investors as well as consumers, and how that may be driving change and development of ESG initiatives. Maureen? Sure. <clears throat> so first of all, Pirelli is a an Italian-based company, and um, and I, I do sustainability and public affairs for North America. Um, but our sustainability came out of Italy and like many Italian companies was uh, was early and strong. Um, we saw a competitive advantage when uh, European sustainability funds uh, started to emerge. That was they were first known as SRI funds, now as ESG. Um, and we saw an opportunity to build on our heritage of stakeholder focus. Um, and uh, and so the drivers really have been those ESG investors, which is now now becoming, as as Fabio mentioned, mainstream. Um, the you know the whole ESG market is exploding, um, and other drivers are our customers. So we're in the supply chain of the automotive industry. We're seeing um, the the automotives driven by uh, regulation, but not only regulation, also um, customer focus and so on. There's obviously a huge transformation going on in the automotive industry to electric vehicles, and that's certainly affecting us and, and driving our sustainability efforts. Other drivers for, uh, for corporations can be NGOs and, uh, of course, consumers. And then voters, particularly in Europe, have been pushing um, policy towards, and I'm sure we'll hear from Estevan about that, um, towards this great transformation, great decarbonization of our of our entire system. And uh, and so I think there will be winners and losers, and companies are really lining up to be on the winning side. Excellent. Uh, yes, we we are going to transition into talking about some of the standards and regulations. But before we get there, I'd, I'd like to give a perspective of some of the specific things that we're seeing companies do, as well as some of the newer opportunities that we're hearing about. I think uh, most people are familiar with offsetting, uh, which has received critical praise, I'll say. And now there's other things emerging, such as insetting. But why don't you kick us off, Shelley, and maybe you can help start to transition us over to the regulation side, and then we'll hear from Istvan and the commission's perspective. Sure, thanks, Brooke. So I'd like to talk briefly about offsetting, as you say, and then also a little bit of insetting. I'm thinking about some of the different types of ESG <clears throat> in the finance space, um, and then just stepping back a little bit and thinking about just um, um, ESG from an opportunity perspective, because we also you know, tend to focus on the risk side. So um, offsetting, you know, as we know, is, is not new. Looking at carbon offsets um, has been an opportunity that has been available. But now, as as you know, some of the statistics we've talked about with companies making their net zero commitments, they're sort of scrambling to look at how they get there. And offsetting is one of those ways. Um, you know, in terms of the numbers of that market, um, you know, with numbers I have say today, it's around 400 million, could grow to 10 to 25 billion by 2030. Um, I, you know, I think with offsetting, one of the most important things is just a word of caution about the quality of the offsets. Because you know, because it has been there for some time. In some cases, some of those numbers are outdated. They're you know of maybe poor quality or harder to quantify. And as we move into the regulations, we'll talk about the the increasing importance of being able to 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 verify and show that data that stands behind the claims that companies are making. Um, you know, looking at at some of that. Um, you know, companies are doing some new things, really, with a focus on carbon dioxide, um, you know, really in interesting ways. I mean, some examples, United Airlines is looking at carbon capture, sort of pulling carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Other companies are looking at ways to use that carbon dioxide within a process, 
for example, gas generation or you know, even you know, Coca-Cola or some of the bottling companies, how can they use that carbon dioxide? Um, so then switching gears a little bit to end setting, um, which is that newer term, is really sort of as opposed to looking at ways outside of my company that I can offset my usage. You know, what can I do within my company to reduce that carbon footprint and usage? And so that is really the continued driver toward looking at sustainable fuels, looking at, you know, is it engine re retrofits or anything within the supply chain of a company, source materials, et cetera, that will, in, in a measurable, because again, we need to be able to measure um, from current usage to, to future state, um, ultimately reduce the, the carbon footprint of that company with, with processes within the company. A couple of important points there, again, sort of back to the verifiable data. Um, you know, if there are greenhouse gas emission reductions, you know, there, there has to be a way to quantify and measure those and verify those. So that is an important piece to keep in mind. Um, turning to um, finance in the area of ESJ, a lot of that relates to the E and sustainable finance, but there are a number of social bonds, for example, under the, under the S and looking at diversity statistics or other measures that people are using. Um, but the real explosion is in is in the um, the E side, right? So so the environmental or green bonds, um, a lot of renewable financing that is an increasing focus. Um, and as mentioned, Brooke, we'll turn to regulation some because because of that proliferation, um, you know, there there are, are for claims of greenwashing and the need to get behind that. And in fact, that will be one of the focal points of what is likely to come out through the SEC this year in the process that they're working for um, are some some quantifiable measures to be able to stand behind um, green claims um, you know, so that harken back in the US to the FTC and green guides on when you can make those claims, um, but, but to be very measurable. And then the last one I wanted to just mention again is to keep in mind that we are talking about opportunities as well as risk. And so some of those are those opportunities. But the other piece is just for companies to think about as they pull together um, their strategy and their goals and their metrics, you know, how they can use those as an opportunity you know, to define themselves, to define their purpose you know, moving forward, particularly with um, customers, employees, and others, uh, you know, other stakeholders who um, you know, are, are you know, care deeply about ESG now, and it, it be, can you know, become an asset. Excellent. So it, it, the things you said, many things that I like, uh, specifically looking at things that need to be measurable, I feel like companies are driving in that direction. And some of the things that Maureen said, the maturity of companies comes from going from the SRI or the CSR and really looking at specific measurable ways and showing the impact both financially and to the stakeholders. So I think regulation is going to add to that. But I would really like to hear from Istvan. Obviously, the commission has been front and center of pushing along any ESG benefits and initiatives. What is your view of where the commission is at today and where we're going, Istvan? Yes. Uh, thank you, Brooke, and uh, thank you for inviting uh, also the European Commission uh, to this panel. Um, to start with, I would like to say that we in the in Europe, in the European Union, we have really a, a very ambitious uh, framework. Um, you have heard about the Green Deal, and we have uh, the foundations of a new sustainable finance framework, the sustainable uh, finance strategy that uh, sets uh, the scene also for the ES ESG and it has different elements. Uh, I will also talk later on when we talk about disclosures, the EU taxonomy. So we try to also define to avoid green bashing what is considered um, uh, as economic activity that is sub uh, substantial contributing to environmental objectives. Um, we also look at the disclosure part um, and also have other uh, tools, uh, a toolbox. I just mentioned one, the EU climate benchmark regulation, uh, which came out last year, or standards for European green bonds. What I'm dealing with uh, 
more closely is the so-called sustainable corporate governance initiative which is also something we are uh, ac actually concentrating on um, beyond uh, the uh, in, 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 within uh, this sustainable finance um, framework and here um, we would like to be very ambitious and propose uh, a legislation that would in, uh, introduce a mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence legislation for companies. So both covering the social and the environmental element of ESG, but the initiative has also the governance part um, included, uh, which means that um, we, we are also looking at um, how the companies are managed, how their sustainable strategies, uh, sustainable risks are, are looked at. So both of these elements are covered in this uh, upcoming legislation. We are still hard, uh, working hard on uh, defining the building blocks and how you can combine it on the scope, on uh, material scope or even enforcement, uh, which are all uh, very relevant. Um, questions uh, and we plan to come out with this new legislation at the end of uh, this year uh, if uh, everything goes well uh, and it fits in a big picture there are very many ongoing initiatives um, be it uh, linked to deforestation or uh, forced labor will be very much on the agenda now uh, as you might might have heard so we have to also find a current approach for businesses that they can take the most benefit of all these uh, regulations, but that it is also implementable for business so that it can create real impact on the ground and uh, contribute you know, to uh, climate change mitigation, to social uh, improvements uh, in, on the ground and in third countries. I could talk a lot about that, but <laughs> I think uh, this uh, is a, a good general intro and I will deal a bit more uh, later on, on, on how we, we deal with the reporting element. Excellent. Well, I think you gave us the best definition of what we've been calling responsible capitalism as well. Um, and all eyes, I think, are on the commission to see what gets rolled out by end of year. So leading off of that, Fabio, I'd like to turn to you and talk a little more specifically about the capital perspective from a sustainable finance view. I think this is primarily a climate focus, but can you dive into that a little bit deep, deeper to offer us some perspective? Sure. So uh, the, we're doing a lot of work on the fund in terms of ESG, particularly on the E side, on the e, as, as you mentioned, on climate. Um, we tend to look at this both from a risk and opportunities perspective. Um, so there are risks as they relate to financial stability, for example. Right? So if you look at the global financial stability report we produced twice a year, uh, we touch upon some of this issue going back a couple of years ago. So in October 19, we had a chapter on a broad stock take of the ESG market, issuance, pricing, who are the main players, investors. But then we start looking at risk more specifically. So we look at physical risk in the global equity markets and the extent to which uh, equity investors were pricing physical risk. And the answer was not really, <laughs> at least back then in April of last year. Um, we had a chapter on what was the impact of COVID on the environmental performance of corporates. And we have a chapter coming up uh, in about less than a week, actually, on the role of the investment fund sector. What role can the investment fund sector play in uh, um, fostering and helping with transition, uh, climate transition? Uh, I can give a very brief preview of that because it touches upon the opportunities as well, right? So the sustainable investment funds has been growing quite fast can be an important driver of this transition and helping foster the transition, but it's also limited in size at present. Um, and there are risks as we touch upon some of this greenwashing, it's one that comes up. Um, it's about not less than $4 trillion, and the climate subset, it's even smaller than that. I, I think it can be, play an important role in terms of opportunities along maybe like three, a uh, couple of, of opportunities and one in terms of risk. And in terms of opportunities, it can support climate stewardship. So you can see that climate, they label themselves as uh, funds, that climate label themselves as climate uh, related. They support, there's a higher share of support in terms of like climate related uh, resolution at the investor level. 
They can also support issuance of green debt equity debt instruments as well as equity instruments by, by firm. So there seems to be fostering the issuance of, 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 of green instruments. And they may bring also some financial stability uh, benefits because they could be uh, less there would be less run risk, right? So if they have a more longer term objective as they relate to climate, it might be less subject subject to the ups and downs of, of market. Now again, the problem here is scale. Oh, they need to be scaled up quite rapidly. And there's this issue of like, as they relate to greenwashing, another risk that essentially boils down to having the right data. So good quality, robust, comparable data across jurisdiction, for example, having in place classification for uh, for climate. Uh, that means taxonomies in some jurisdiction. I think the commission just mentioned the European taxonomy. There are other jurisdictions though where there are no public taxonomy, right? There's maybe private taxonomy. So how to think in terms of an, an umbrella that takes into account both jurisdiction with taxonomy, those without taxonomy, and both public as well as private effort. So we're trying to do some more thinking of principle that could be encompassed in both of these projects. And then disclosure. That's all the work on disclosure as they relate to the so many disclosure standards and there seems to be momentum towards some sort of convergence uh, under the IFRS Foundation effort uh, based on the TCFD working with Yosco. I, I think overall our interest here at perspective from the fund where I sit, the, the, the seat where I am now, is to essentially foster convergence because those are global capital market. So for this market, for private finance to be scaled up in size and quickly to make a difference in terms of helping the transition to a green economy, this needs to be done in a way um, that has to happen quickly and you need to do in scale. So how can, can we help that transition uh, and, and foster convergence across global capital markets? Ultimately, markets are global, right? So uh, fragmentation of markets or regulatory landscape across jurisdiction uh, has the risk of hindering uh, the growth of these markets. I'm happy to go back to more uh, to more specific, but that's more or less like what we think in terms of risk opportunities. Uh, excellent. Yes, and you said several things, and I want to turn to um, Maureen. So uh, we've been talking a little bit about regulation requirements. Uh, Shelley has mentioned the SEC. Um, there's other U.S. federal legislation, CFTC and, and Treasury and beyond. Of course, Esteban, the Commission, EU Green Deal, and things to come by the end of this year. In addition to that, Fabio, you mentioned a lot of the standards organizations that have um, information out there for reporting, measurement purposes. So Maureen, this is a lot of information to consider for a corporation. And on top of all of that, hello COVID, which was also mentioned by Fabio. So can you talk to us a little bit about what has Pirelli Tire done? How are you responding, not only to what your ESG goals have been and you're maturing as a corporation, how are you looking at the multiple standards, the current regulations, as well as what is to come with respect to COVID now and maybe the new normal? Well, so, so in other words, how do we bring all this down to earth and, <laughs> and what does it look like on the right. ground? Um, so yeah so i would i would pick up I'll, I'll pick up on the risk opportunity um dialogue that shelly and fabio talked about so we look at integrating uh esg into the business and into the bottom line in terms of three areas one is um growth opportunities and and, and you know revenue opportunities uh the second area is cost savings and the third area is um, risk avoidance, right? And so, so I guess I'll start with risk avoidance. Um, so we we basically took a, a a handbook that the World Business Council for Sustainable Development uh, put together with COSO, which is uh, C O S O, um, which is account accounting an accounting association, and um, and layered in uh, ESG throughout our enterprise risk management. Uh, so, so just really fortifying the, the foundations of the business with, um, with environmental, social and governance risk um, mitigation and you know, assessment mitigation and so on layered into our, our process. Um, 
And then in terms of cost savings, I think that's the low hanging fruit that everyone starts with in terms of um, you know, energy savings and things like that. And sometimes you have to invest. And so it, it's a little bit of a, um, a game in terms of the longer, longer term and shorter term um, folk, you know, timelines. And then in terms of opportunities for growth, um, we we really looked at our business and and started focusing heavily on we did you know we did the whole life cycle assessment of the tires and uh, focused on how we could get um, the most impact out of our actions and in terms of making environmentally friendly um, and safe tires and then also we did things like. Uh, we recently did a partnership with BMW to uh, certify the first tires uh, with Forest Stewardship Council certification, just like you get on paper. So we have a little logo on the sidewall of the tire for FSC certified tires, which means that they did not cause deforestation, um, which of course is part of the decarbonization picture. It's not just renewable energy; it's it's avoiding uh, deforestation and and other things. Um, but you asked about all these standards and um, and you know how to how to keep an eye on the landscape and not get lost. I think there's a lot of alignment, despite you know the fact that it there are so many acronyms and it looks confusing. And if you know if you're new to it, it's it looks like just uh, chaos. But um, but as I said, we started early and um, and really, you know, the frameworks align uh, nicely with each other. And when the European directive came on, came along um, for mandatory ESG reporting, we were well placed for that. And we, we added a couple of things in terms of the assurance on the insur assurance side. Um, but to you know to strengthen that reporting. But I, I will say that reporting is a driver of action because when you start, you, what you start with is reporting everything. You know, the, it's it's a focus on transparency, not a focus on absolute, um, you know, goodness or badness. Um, it's a focus on transparency. So you report all the data that you can, and then and so all of those frameworks really are looking at you know, how, how much data can we come up with? And so we come up with as much as we can. And uh, and then and then we set goals and then we improve on the goals and then we report back. And so it, it becomes this process for improvement, right? The, the reporting itself. Um, so that's how I think I would I would define it. Of course, there are lots of, of frameworks and lots of regulation to keep an eye on, but it's all going in the same direction. Um, one of the things that I've been involved in a lot in my job is the external, um, the collaborative, uh, pre-competitive collaboration with, with competitors and with the automotive industry in getting ahead of these things. So the automotive industry is, is trying to figure out responsible sourcing which um, I think started in a way with conflict minerals and everybody got on the same page around that and that provided a template for anything else, right? So then you can, you know, from that we figured out how to map our supply chains, how to um, move the focus to human rights and, uh, and how, to, how to use these templates to bring everyone together around these issues. Uh, we figured out uh, the tire industry figured out from the palm oil industry how to how to tackle deforestation altogether in a collaborative way. So there's um, so yes, there are a lot of frameworks and ratings and rankings and standards and regulations, but uh, it's all going in the same direction. And I think um, I think we're pretty much all on the same page. And it's it'll I think I do think the EU is is leading. And so it'll be interesting to see what happens in the U.S. I think the U.S. could make big leaps forward or not. <laughs> you know. Yeah, excellent point. And I want to stay on that for a minute. Thank you, Maureen, for that insight. Um, looking at you know certainly what uh, the EU has done thus far in certain cases, very clear and very specific. 
the U.S. is is not as well known for being so prescriptive. It's typically more of a principled approach. But what I would really like to hear, and and maybe Esteban and Shelley, uh, you can offer some perspective. What are your thoughts on that? Fabio also mentioned IFRS moving to a comprehensive reporting schema, which should potentially lead to this, we're all moving in the same direction for Maureen. What are your thoughts about global convergence? You know, certainly Istvan, let's start with you, where the EU stands today, where the commission is going. And then Shelley, I'd like to hear your perspective, given that the US is inching towards emerging regulation. Istvan? You're on. Oh, you can hear me, I think. So I would like to just refer back to Maureen uh, uh, that in the EU, we have already actually a framework for reporting, which started with the big companies since 2014. So it's actually already seven years old, uh, the non-financial reporting that was looking at uh, all these elements on environmental matters, social matters, anti-corruption, respect from human rights. So it's really covering the ESG. And now we are updating it that, uh, or this year, uh, we call it Corporate uh, Sustainable Reporting Directive. And basically we are broadening the scope uh, of also the companies. So now it's only just listed uh, big companies and banks and insurance companies, but it's all large companies and all companies listed on regulated markets, which will be covered, so except for micro SMEs. And I think we are also setting the standards this way a bit, uh, even on uh, globally, because the big companies, uh, they, they are multinationals, so there is a spillover effect, uh, hopefully, in also other regions in the world. Uh, the reporting, it was um, more voluntary in the, in the first part, or there were more voluntary elements. Now there will be uh, more standardized and compulsory elements. And we are also working to set standards because that's important that we don't have uh, hundreds of different uh, reporting uh, standards. And there is intense work going on that. And so, um, uh, and it's very much also interlinked with the, the, the EU taxonomy. So, the CSRD uh, reporting standards. And um, as we mentioned, the, the taxonomy for environmental activities, but now we are even thinking of on social taxonomy to, to come in the picture. So there are, that's a, a constantly moving target in a way, which, which is a, a bit, uh, make, making it uh, comp complex and difficult. But uh, once the standards are there, that will clarify a lot. And even for those SMEs who are not covered by this uh, report, uh, we are proposing um, voluntary simplified standards um, that they could use and I think that can be used also uh, globally or could be uh, a good uh, blueprint for, for global action later on. This is Shelley. Um, I, you know, I think for, for me I want to just from the US perspective talk a little bit about current state and then near-term future state. Current state, um, you know, there are no specific mandatory disclosures on on climate, um, which is not to say that we don't have an obligation to disclose in the U.S. for public companies through the SEC, because we've always had the obligation to disclose that which rises to a level of materiality for a reasonable investor. Um, but then you sort of jump to 2010, where we did have from the SEC um, guidance on climate risk, followed, as Marie mentioned, a couple of years after by uh, conflict minerals, and then very recently um, um, some requirements on diversity, certain diversity disclosures. So what we had instead was those stakeholders who were emerging and all of the alphabet soup of framework that the book you've mentioned. And what we found is that, you know, particularly with companies that were sort of jumping into CSR and ESG, um, a little bit later in the game and trying to respond to that proliferation of frameworks, um, some of what often happened was, for example, ISS um, 
will grade you whether you study for the test or not. So some of those companies more recently have been, you know, been a little bit of a sort of teaching to the test, responding to, um, you know, those, what was happening out there and what they were, you know, being told to focus on through ISS and, and others. And so it's been emerging in that way. Um, and, and yes, qualitative um, rather than any specific taxonomy and really a struggle, um, you know, to decide which among the various frameworks to dive into because there's a lot of work to be done to get up to speed. Um, you know, near term future state, we over the course of 21 have had, um, in particular with the SEC, a task force that formed early in the year, a call for comment that went through the summer, um, and they ended up accepting comment letters even well beyond that, um, and listening sessions with investors, other stakeholders, and companies. Um, over 550 comment letters were um, received, and three out of four did support some mandatory disclosure. I think a large part of that is just the realization of, you know, we, we can't sustain this proliferation. And as the SEC and Terry Gensler have said, we need something that is, you know, is is consistent um, and measurable and decision useful. Um, so originally, that guidance was due to come out uh, in October. Some recent comments have suggested sometime maybe between October and end of the year. And the pieces that will most likely be addressed, the components of that, um, will largely focus on climate risk. So some variety of mandatory greenhouse gas emission disclosure um, that is uh, you know, decision useful. Um, some discussion of sort of, you know, is it is it something that can be globally sustained, but but most likely um, qualitative and most likely not latching onto an existing framework, but modeled off of um, in particular TCFD. Um, there have been you know supportive quotes of of some of the support of that coming out of the G7 summit. And then in addition to that, um, likely some requirements on greenwashing, because again, that's one of the focuses on investor um, protection is is the, the, the rise of, of green everything um, from the opportunity perspective, as well as looking at the S and the G, some prescriptive requirements on diversity, equity, inclusion, disclosures, as well as um, cyber from a governance framework. So that's what we're waiting for from the SEC. Jurgens also said, you know, the certain companies, in particular those that focus on transportation, the financial industry, and insurance, um, would likely have um, a heightened heightened disclosures and requirements. So looking at the financial institutions, um, there also has been over the course of this year a, a real sort of rush to analysis and support and joining for example, with the central banks for the greening of financial institutions. And there is, is support and activity in every arm, uh, OFCC, the FDIC, the Reserve Bank, um, Treasury Secretary Yellen, um, all have groups focusing. And so companies now are sort of reading and watching and wondering how to react to that and how to balance the efforts they've been making toward the frameworks with what they're now gonna have to react to. Um, and, and so as we talk about um, disclosure and reporting, you know, I think right now that's one of those things for companies to be thinking about um, because you've got to be able to have the tools to measure and disclose and, and whether those are internal or um, externally supplied, you know, there's a readiness that needs to be happening right now. And Brooke, you mentioned, you know, COVID, you know, the other thing about COVID is, you know, it's really a, it's, it's an on here. Um, so, companies want to reach back look at baseline if they haven't yet is it 2018 or 2019 and get there um, some of covid it, it has been an advantage i mean the rush to digitization the reduction of space I mean, there are things that have been happening that would be positive on the esg trajectory that companies would want to take advantage of excellent yes, uh, I like what you were saying. There's this proliferation of green. Um, Fabio, I'd like to turn to you because um, you also mentioned, you know, a focus on stability, uh, that the fund has a goal around, you know, not only sustainable finance, but providing stability. 
how do you envision the fund rolling out maybe more guidance or what are your thoughts on existing guidance and what sort of communication to the market do you envision happening as that proliferation of green continues and disclosure requirements increase as well? So uh, let me start, maybe get back to the point here of taxonomies and other approaches, right? So there are currently about 200 plus taxonomy slash classification slash depending on what word you want to use here. And so this is in some sense, I think the risk I was trying to highlight before, and that's why we plan to do more work uh, with other international financial institutions like the World Bank and the OECD to try to come up with some principle that can encompass both, again, public as well as private sector approaches, taxonomy-based, more, more activity-based approaches, but also principle-based like the US. Uh, with the goal of managing towards some sort of convergence. Like what hasn't been mentioned here is that there are particular challenges for emerging markets again, right? Emerging markets, the transition risk, it's a risk that it's much more uh, prominent than when you talk about the US or you talk about the European Union. And challenges that come with that in terms of availability of data and how to think about classification of finance there and what, uh, what needs to be done. That, that's why we're trying to take this broad approach to, to foster some sort of like minimal convergence at the global level, which I think will help actually foster a capital market and sustainable finance. Now, the work that we do, we do along different lines. So there will be more work in what we call EPSAP, the financial sector assessment programs. So when we assess the country resilience of the financial system, both banks and say insurance companies, investment funds, thinking about both the resilience to physical risk as well as to transition risk. So start thinking more about like stress testing along those lines. That's one approach. Uh, the other approach is, of course, there's a lot of work within the fund in terms of like carbon pricing, for example, and the need for carbon pricing. There's been quite a bit of work on that line. And also in terms of international engagement, I think that's where the fund can play another important role. So I am co-chairing a work stream at the NGFS, uh, the Network for Green the Financial System, together with the ECB on bridging the climate data gap. So looking at data needs and data availability and how to close the gap between what is needed and what is available in terms of decision decision useful information but quality robust compa comparable data and also with an eye on uh, verification and all of this data again to avoid greenwashing and other risks uh, we also do other work we support the ifrs foundation i represent the fund there and a number of other international for like the fsb where we focus primarily on financial stability risk so the way we look, just to close, to look at this, is this is what we call the climate uh, information architecture. Right? So you need good data, you need uh, convergence over this classification, both in advanced economies and emerging market. Then you need convergence to, in terms of standards. And I think on the, la on the last one, on the standard, there is good momentum toward that convergence, again, with the IFRS Foundation work going into COP26. And COP26 can be a good moment of crystallizing some of these efforts um, and get to a further push. Again, we need more private finance to do this. And so how to scale up in a way that it's quick, but also respectful of a number of important principle in terms of like data as well as, as avoiding uh, greenwashing. Excellent. Uh, great points. Maureen, I want to turn back to you. You touched on a few of the things that Fabio just mentioned, data being obviously a huge focus area for companies needing to measure their efforts in ESG and ultimately using that data for reporting purposes. Can you talk to us about how Pirelli Tire approaches looking at the data, the integrity of the data, the measurement of the data, and whether you prioritize that data to measure certain areas over other perhaps from a materiality perspective and how you make those decisions. So if you can walk us through, what is the approach in looking at data and ensuring that once you report out, you're also considering some of the requirements around that reporting and certainly consideration around greenwashing? Yeah, so actually on, on greenwashing, I mean, I've, I, I have been to a number of conferences over the years in the, here in the U.S. where their companies were debating what is the sustainability report, and um, and I, I think I was you know kind of a rare person that was saying the sustainability report is for investors. It's full of data. 
it needs more data <laughs> and it needs you know verified comparable data and other people were saying it needs pictures it needs to be short it needs to be <laughs> uh narr you know tell a story etc so i think i mean you can certainly have marketing brochures but i think uh i think this concept needs to be really you know hammered through that we're just because it's um it's non-financial which i would question that anyway um but because it's non-financial it is um, somehow wishy-washy and, and you're going to turn it into a story, a storytelling exercise with pretty pictures. So uh, that's where I would start. And then, so what we do is we, we created an internal software to, to collect data. We started with the GRI uh, KPIs list. Uh, if anyone doesn't know what that is, it's, it's sort of the base of um, multinational ESG reporting is this GRI framework, which was the global reporting initiative. Um, and then we added on to that. And um, we we do integrated reporting, um, which in a nutshell is an attempt to uh, to really, really, um, really drive stakeholder capitalism. So it's an attempt to um, put metrics on the value creation for all stakeholders and all different kinds of capitals. So we're not just talking about financial capital, we're talking about, we're trying to put um, numbers around environmental capital, uh, natural capital it's called, uh, human capital, and, uh, and obviously intellectual property is another intangible. Um, and, and so all of those intangibles that actually make up a lot of the, the market cap uh, value of companies today, integrated reporting has been a way to try to to try to drive that process. Um, and so, what's next? I think we just need you know more and more data. As Fabio said, the emerging markets are it's going to be hard to uh, to do that. But maybe through the supply chain reporting, uh, we can start to get there. And uh, we're going to see, I think, more diversity, equity, and inclusion data. Um, which again, it, some things that are this on the social side a little bit harder to find the metrics, but uh, we need to and and we will. And then um, and then the concept of materiality. So uh, Shelley mentioned it's uh, it's been you know it was defined for investing purposes as what is material for the reasonable investor, which I I think puts a little bit of a short term uh, time frame around it. And then with GRI, there was a different uh, definition of materiality, which was more what is industry specific, what is important, what is a priority for your industry, which is maybe different from other industries. And so, for example, biodiversity would be important, an important topic for the paper industry, but maybe not for the software industry. And then now what we're seeing, I think, is a lot of um, just weighing the, this idea that companies are responsible for um, societal uh, problems and and solutions. And so, if you know, if I'm a company in a desert a drought area that guzzles water, am I doing something about water in general? You know, global water. And uh, and so that becomes material for me. And so materiality is becoming larger, I think. And and we're you know we're really looking at the what is what is the impact of a company even even with science based targets we're looking at what is my share of global warming and and what is my um, responsibility to fix. And so, so I think that's changing, and I think we'll see more of that. And especially if we get into things like a carbon tax. But all, but you know, business is. I think what this points to is that business is key to this uh, decarbonization that we have to enact in our society. And so, um, so all of these larger societal issues must be material to business and must be reported on eventually. Uh, it 100%. And I'd like to think it, it's nicely going back to one of the original things I said, which was that new definition of the corporation 
existing for purposes of all stakeholders, which creates longer term value. And I think Maureen, exactly to your point of what is material to your corporation, it's not just that short term value or creation of value for the shareholder, it's for all stakeholders. So really important points. So we're, we're coming up on five minutes. What I'd like to do now is get each of your perspectives, sort of key takeaways, but but also I think for this audience, it would be helpful from your perspective, maybe what pitfalls to avoid. Obviously, as corporations continue to build out their ESG programs or look to sustainable finance, they're going to need some considerations of not only the what to do, but the what not to do. So. Esteban, can we start with you? Uh, curious, and uh, I don't know what, how the commission feels about pretty pictures in reporting that Maureen talked about, but why don't you tell us what some of your key takeaways and key pitfalls to avoid would be? You're on mute. I just wanted to report to that because I like this example and uh, I agree. Uh, companies need to ensure to get the data uh, and report really on that because as you have uh, said uh, the ESG funds are uh, exploding the market and for that you need need to convince also investors uh, with data uh, and that's a pitfall not to to really just uh, showcase or uh, you know some best practices or some nice brochures but take it serious it will it will be with us uh, and we need to act very quickly actually if we want to reach uh, any any impact and the time is ticking very quickly so um that's that's in short uh, take bold and quick steps in your companies i like it all right shelly your perspective you're on mute there we go. I'll pick up a little bit on what Maureen was saying, just as a caution to companies, because ESG often has emerged um, sort of off on its own as part of that that um, storytelling and um, you know less of the financial piece. As we ready for mandatory disclosures, particularly from a U.S. perspective, um, you know, public companies in particular have the tools um, for the you know for the for the data and the rigor that they need to have through you know, finance teams, disclosure committees, et cetera, for how they deal with their financial data. Um, and, and their ESG steering committees or groups need to be aligned with that. And then particularly as we look at um, zero emissions, to the extent we need others to help, they also often have a robust third-party risk framework. And that's gonna be a huge aspect of comfort in the data when it's not coming from inside the company. Great. Fabio, final thoughts? Mm, I'll go back to the data. I mean, to me, in my mind, it all starts with the data, right? Whether you think of risk or whether you think of opportunities. And you need to have good quality, robust, decision useful data that can be comparable across jurisdiction. Um, that's a starting point. Yeah, otherwise, it, you can have classification, you can have taxonomy, you can have disclosure, but it does start with the data. And the data chain starts with corporations, essentially. So it's important that there is good disclosure of those. Uh, also make sure that they are verifiable, right? Those are data that can be actually be used. There needs to be, in terms of like what we learn in terms of data um, needs, there needs to be forward-looking. So there's a big gaps in terms of forward-looking data, right? in terms of metrics and in terms of targets. That's the only way to keep them in the end corporations and as well as financial institutions accountable. It needs to be verified in terms of forward-looking data. And also more information in terms of granularity for physical risk. And there's a lot of technology there that can help to do that, right? Geospatial data, so satellite images, open source, artificial intelligence. So make good use of the technology available and lever on that. Excellent. Maureen, final thought? So my final thought is that, uh, you know, having said that business is is instrumental in this huge transition that we meet, need to make, I um, my final thought is we we actually need regulation and business, especially in the United States, needs to be on board and needs to get its lobbying and public affairs uh, advocacy behind um, making the transition work for everyone 
rather than trying to resist change. So that's my final thought. Boy, yeah, I, I think that's a whole nother session we could go into. <laughs> well, this is a great panel. Thank you all. I believe I am going to turn it back over to Yvonne. Really appreciate all of your time and insight it was just invaluable. Thank you also from the from the EACC. Really, really interesting discussion and um, fabulous panel. Um, really, I, I couldn't be happier about uh, the caliber of people we we were able to to assemble for this discussion. Um, we will um, post a recording of the of the webinar on our YouTube channel, so stay tuned for that. And be sure um, to attend um, some of the other programs we're planning. We have a US-Canada immigration update for international travelers. Um, we are hosting a Europe post Merkel, how the transatlantic relationship will develop with a new German government, um, a discussion about Europe's Green Deal um, and the US climate and, uh, ambitions as well as a um, program on green batteries, um, the developments on that in Europe and the US. So be sure to check our website, join us for them, register. And um, a quick reminder, if you're a member of the EICC, we can connect you with the other participants of this program. So uh, um, you will have a list um, in the, uh, um, which we will send out after the, after the event. But again, thank you to our panel, really, really interesting discussion. Fascinating.